So government intervention and government planning, whether it's through the Federal Reserve or through Congress, doesn't work. The people have to plan. The people may have to decide how the money is being spent, not the government and not the politicians and not the bureaucrats. Today, though, we have not resolved that, and it is yet to come because this debt is still hanging. Not only that, is our government, our Secretary of the Treasury, as well as the Federal Reserve, have traveled quite frequently, and they talk to the Europeans all the time. And they have essentially promised that we will bail out Europe because we have the reserve currency, and there's still some trust in the dollar. So they have essentially said, we will be there. We will not let those banks fail. Guess who the banks are? They're big banks that we have that have branch banks over there. They're intertwined. They're global in nature. And guess what? The banks and the branches in Europe, guess what they bought? They bought debt from Greece and Portugal and, and Spain. And they say, well, the debt is illiquid now. What are we going to do? Illiquid means it's worthless. But they own it. They don't want to go bankrupt. So we're over there promising more that we will be bailing them out by printing more money. But the, the, the tough part of this, and they better wake up and understand it, is that you just can't do that forever. Eventually, what it does, it destroys the confidence in the dollar. And right now, I think that is happening. Because now the money is starting to circulate. that has been produced and created in the last four or five years. You've heard about gasoline prices. There's one place in Florida, gasoline prices hit $6 the other day. And, uh, and yet, what, what does Bernanke tell us? Bernanke tells us there's no inflation. Of course, he has, a different, he has a different definition of inflation. Inflation, technically, in the free market is when you print, print money and create money. He's tripled the supply of money in these last three years. That's inflation. And then one of the consequences of inflating the currency are higher prices. So over the years, what did we had? We had high prices in the NASDAQ bubble, and we had high prices in the, in the housing bubble. We have high prices wherever government gets their fingers involved in education, prices of education, much higher than the cost of living, cost of medical care it's it's uh, very very high and uh, th this and, and then they tell you you know that there, there isn't any inflation but even if you use the old uh, uh, the old calculation for the CPI the uh, our price is going up about seven percent and he's telling us it's going up two percent so in, in other words let's say it is two percent what he's telling us is that they're allowed to steal 2% of our money every single year and, and not, be, not be charged with a crime. <laughs> Matter of fact, I've asked both Greenspan and Bernanke in committee about this, about the morality of it and the economics of it. And they said, well, we have to keep interest rates low. We have to do this to keep the economy going. We have to look at the big picture. And some, and some people just are going to suffer. Now, that, that is not very nice. <laughs> Because guess who suffers? The very people who might want to take care of themselves, the people who save money, the people in retirement, people living on Social Security, because their cost of living right now is going up a lot more than, than 2%. So he says that's a consequence. Now, if you had a free market, you know what people might make on their CDs? It could be 6 or 7 or 8% because that's where the market would be. And, uh, the, but the, the other major problem when the Fed gets involved in artificially low, lower interest rates, it causes what we call malinvestment. People do things they shouldn't be doing. Even if you don't see the prices rising, they invest because they think there's been a lot of savings. They might build too many houses or build too many casinos down in Las Vegas and all the different things. So this is the mischief of the Federal Reserve and uh, eventually it'll be dealt with. This is not new. Destruction of money has been around for a long time and inevitably when they finally destroy the currency, they always have to go back to something that people know about and they trust and they go back Back, just as the founders went back. They had runaway inflation with the continental dollar. They put in the Constitution, only gold and silver can be legal tender. And they, also, and they also said you could not e emit bills of credit, which is paper money. And they also said, we give you no authority to establish a central bank. 
Now, immediately there was a great debate between Jefferson and Hamilton, uh, and uh, in the early years, of course, uh, uh, they kept getting rid of the National Bank, but uh, we've been suffering with this for the last, uh, you know, the last hundred years. So uh, I'm hoping on the 100th anniversary that we have a bill that we can pass that says uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve, we're going to have a bill that's going to repeal the Federal Reserve Act. <laughs> major flaw with a monetary system like this, it enables governments to grow in a sinister manner. If you, Jefferson didn't want to even be able to borrow money, but he, he didn't win that fight. But if they tax this for everything that they do, and we had to send them a check every month, believe me, this would all end rather quickly because the people would rebel. Matter of fact, just uh, to make that point, I introduced a bill one time to repeal withholding taxes. Why should the businessman be a slave and collect those these papers and fill out all these forms. <laughs> but but the, the, real, the real benefit would be the people would know how much they're paying for the government and there would be a quick rebellion that would get us back on track again. <laughs> But because the uh, borrowing can become noticeable, if you didn't have the Fed to monetize debt, the borrowing would push interest rates up, and then the Congress would have to quit spending because uh, the more they spent, the higher the interest rates would go up. But we don't have that check. And so we have the Federal Reserve that just prints the money when the federal government uh, n needs the money. So it does hide things, and the victims are sometimes unknown. There's not known immediately, and, uh, and, and they can get away with that until the end point when the, uh, when the currency is destroyed. But in the meantime, you might have decades of this. We've, we went off the gold standard completely in 1971. These last 40 years have been nothing but a big bubble uh, being formed. But during that time, just think of what has grown. The entitlement system and the warfare system. The military industrial complex that Eisenhower war warned us about. It's alive and well and they're spending money. And the, the thing that really, even though I've studied this for a long time about in Congress, and I know how so many of you feel uh, they're, they're, they're living with their head in the sand. They're in oblivion in Washington. They don't even, if they thought that the problem was one-tenth as serious as I think that, uh, that it is, they would quit spending. That's what they should do. The whole system fed on itself. The entitlement system is uh, alive and well. Politicians did quite well uh, by, you know, just promising whatever the people wanted. We could borrow, spend. We're a wealthy nation, and we were. We were the wealthiest nation ever because we were the freest nation. Of course, today we're not the freest nation, and we're not the richest nation uh, anymore. But the entitlement system got way off base because entitlement sounds like a good, good word. You know, uh, we're. We're, we would like to say we're entitled to our right to our life and to, and to our liberties, but we're not entitled to somebody else's money. Entitlements have become what people through the politician demand or want or insist on, and the politicians accommodate, and they become entitlements. And literally, I imagine more than 50% of the people in this country still think that an entitlement is a right, but an entitlement isn't a right. We get our lives and our liberty from our Creator. We get it in a natural way. We, we don't. We don't get it, we don't get it from, from the government, but if we have a right to our life and our liberties, we ought to have a right to keep the fruits of our labor. <laughs> which, which of course means there would be no income tax if you could live with that. <laughs> You know, a lot of people will, will challenge me, of course, because uh, I, want, I want to start off the first year with, uh, you know, a token cut of one trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, 
and quite frequently, the questions are very sincere because they've studied only Keynesian economics. And I say, well, what will happen? We're in a recession. What would happen if the government quit spending a trillion dollars? I said, well, think of it this way. It isn't so much that the government's going to, the fact that the government's quit and spend a trillion dollars. It would be that the government would quit spending it and the people would spend the trillion dollars. <laughs> And that's, and that's what would happen, and that would be much better. I, quite frankly, am very frank about what I think the nature and the uh, philosophy of a president ought to be. The president shouldn't be running the economy. You know, uh, it's, uh, the president doesn't know what to do. The Congress doesn't know what to do. Only the people know what to do on how to run the economy. <laughs> Now, I don't say that we can get out of this mess by snapping our fingers and everything will be perfect, but I know what we're doing is wrong and it's prolonging the agony and it's going to be worse in our depression if we don't uh, change our ways. But what, uh, what we need to do, though, is not scare people with what the correction is all about. Because I don't think we should propose our viewpoints by saying, well, I have the problems as long as you're willing to sacrifice. But why would it be that if I came along and talked to the businessman and to you in this, in this audience and say, look, what I want to do is I want to deregulate you. I don't want the federal government down in your states and having mandates. I don't think it's a sacrifice to have less regulations from the federal government. And how would it be a sacrifice to you if, it could, if you could trust the currency? How many here now would say, well, I'm saving for my ch children's education. I'm going to buy a 20-year bond and make a half a percent or a quarter percent, and I know I'll have the purchasing power in 20 years. Nobody believes that. You know? So what if you had sound money and you could save money and you could be confident that you can take care of your future? What else? Not only that, the prices of education would come down. But why would it be a sacrifice? to us if you didn't have any income tax. That doesn't sound like a sacrifice to me. I would think this would be wonderful. <laughs> But not only would we have to change, it, the people have to change their attitude about what the role of government ought to be. And that is important because no matter how many people have in Washington, they, they will reflect the demands of the people. So if the, if the people still say entitlements are rights and we want to uh, steal money from one group and you give it to us, it's not going to work. So in, we have to change the people's attitude about the role of government. But there's another area that we have to at least address, and I believe we have to change to get this correction over with. And that has to do with what we're doing overseas. We're spending, the DOD budget's not this big, but believe me, there are a lot of other budgets that are involved in what we're doing overseas. The, the intervention, the State Department, the CIA, uh, our troops, and taking care of the wounded and all, it's costing us over a trillion dollars. Our wars in the last 10 years, 10, 11 years now, has added $4 trillion worth of debt to our, our national debt. But just think of, what if we'd have had this $4 trillion in the economy? Just think how much richer this economy would be. And what have we gotten for all these wars? We've gotten nothing but grief. I mean, we're not spreading our Constitution. We're not spreading our goodness. We're spreading a viewpoint of America, which I don't think is a good viewpoint of America. I. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of people believe they have a moral obligation, starting with Woodrow Wilson, that we had to prove to the world that uh, uh, we were the most moral and, and, and most uh, wise nation, and we had, the, we had the right and the obligation to force our way and, uh, and, and to teach other people. They, this, this, though, doesn't work. Using force to force our goodness on anybody cancels out all the goodness. If you, 